the extremists, they're going to try to use this moment to chill our ability to talk about where our country is going. And we can't allow that to happen. As as Katie Paris said, I thought it was perfect. The opposite of political violence is not silence. Oh, absolutely not. We got to address the suburban women problem because it's real. What do an economist, a microbiologist and state representative, and a fierce advocate for democracy have in common? We're We're all suburban suburban moms. moms. The far right is trying to win over suburban women by pretending they're reasonable, even relatable. But we're smarter than that. Join us for a political journey through the eyes of suburban women, one conversation at a time. Welcome to The Suburban Women Problem, a podcast from Red, Wine, and Blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amanda Weinstein. I'm Jasmine Clark. I'm Jess McIntosh, filling in for Rachel Vindman. And you're listening to The Suburban Women Problem. We're excited to have you back on the pod, Jess. You know, I was uh, scheduled to be here before we knew what kind of a news week it was going to be. And now I am extra honored that I get to break it down with you both. Thank you so much for having me again. Oh, yes. We have a lot to break down this week. Understatement of the day. Oh, yeah. (laughs) We spend a lot of time talking about how important it is to vote, uh, which we still know, regardless of what happens, it is very important uh, that we vote. But we don't hear as much about the voting process itself. How does it work? Is election fraud actually an issue? This week, I'm excited to share our interview with Scott Anderson, the president of the Strategic Victory Fund and an expert on all things elections. But first, we have to talk about the news. Jess, I'm glad you're with us today because, wow, the news is absolutely wild. So Jess, let me ask you, what happened this weekend? Anything interesting in the news? Yeah, I mean, this is, I can't remember when when the last weekend we actually got to enjoy was. Uh, this, it's just, it's been, it's been absolutely nonstop. And every time something wild happens, uh, somebody that I work with reminds me that it is only going to get weirder. And um, I've been saying, I'm like, we're starting out, we're coming in hot on the weirdness and craziness already, right? Yeah, I mean, the bar is raised at this point. Like, how do you only get weirder from here? So, I mean, somebody took a shot at, at Donald Trump uh, at his at his rally on Saturday. There was one casualty aside from the shooter himself. A, a, a man at the rally was was killed. There are two other people in critical condition. This is the you know, uh, it, it is. Um, the latest in a very long, very disturbing line of escalating political violence in this country. We, um, you know, we, we've seen a kidnapping plot against a sitting United States governor, uh, Gretchen Whitmer. And if you don't remember that story, it's just because it didn't get nearly the coverage that it deserved, which would start to tell us that this kind of thing was happening. We've seen um, a, a man, a uh, break into Nancy Pelosi's home and attack her husband with a hammer. We have seen countless election officials, just normal people, you know, participating in democracy and and, and making our election systems run, receive threats and and harassment and um, in some cases assaults. Uh, we have seen protests that have turned deadly, as in, you know, Charlottesville, when Heather Hare lost her life um, protesting for uh, against Nazis. So this is, uh, you know, this is this is the latest in in what has been a, a, a long line of, of political violence that has that has come to the forefront in this country. And, and, and I just want to start by saying, look, we we understand that support for political violence. You're going to see headlines that say support for political violence is at an all time high. And yeah, it's at 10%. And that's freaky. It's freaky that there are 10% of this country that is for it. However, that means 90% are against it. Like, look around you, everybody in the room is against political violence, almost certainly. So like, so, so let's just all remember that the vast majority of us condemn this in all forms, do not want to see it. We want to solve our problems at the ballot box. We believe that that is where democracy, that is the front lines of democracy. There is no need to arm oneself. And I just want to point out, there are many organizations that have data on this. This is not just a talking point from the Democrats saying that this is on the rise. We have documented data on hate groups and hate group actions and violence 
and hateful things from the Anti-Defamation League to other organizations that track this, that this has been data backed and people have been talking about the rise of this for a while. I think it's so important and also being completely missed in the current coverage of what happened that this is not an isolated, maybe even unexpected event, but it is a natural progression to where we have gone as a country when it comes to politics and political violence. Because uh, Jess, you mentioned, you know, the kidnapping, you can uh, mention the attack on Pelosi's husband, and you mentioned things like uh, politicians, even some of my colleagues, and election poll workers and people having to, you know, seek protection from harassment and threats. But let's also not forget January 6th. That was a violent day. There right. was a violent day. And so I think that as we first, as more and more information comes out, you know, by the time this recording comes out, I don't even know what new information we'll have compared to what we're discussing today, um, because I think the information is kind of moving fast. And there's a lot of people that are, you know, saying a lot of different things from a lot of different angles and all this stuff. But um, at the end of the day, I think it's really important for us to recognize and I think Joe Biden made this point in his speech. We are and have been headed in the wrong direction in this country when it comes to our ability to have political discourse in a way that still honors the freedom and democracy that we're supposed to espouse as a country. Like we just aren't doing that anymore. And we haven't been for a while. And I, I, I know that's hard when you think about some of the things that uh, people who don't agree with you politically, some of the things they want to do. Like, it's very hard to be like, yeah, let's be kumbaya with these people and unify with these people. Because the truth is, no, there are definitely people um, who are trying to take my rights away. There are definitely people that do not, um, you know, that are trying to take the rights away of LGBTQ individuals and and children and women and, you know, uh, uh, immigrants and Black people. You know, there's all these things. So let's not act like that is, like, not happening. Right. But at the same time, I think we have gotten to a place where while 90% of us agree political violence is bad, there are also quite a few people that are like, but we saw this coming. Like, I'm actually not that surprised by this. And that scares me. Honestly, in the United States, we are so used to guns that people are basically like, yeah, this is par for the course for our country. That's a scary thing for me to think about because I don't want to live in a country where people are getting shot at, you know, giving speeches, no matter who they are. Because guess what, guys? I give speeches. I don't want to be shot at. And I don't even want us to feel like that's a normal everyday part of American life. I saw a man on the street interview right after the rally with a young person whose age wasn't identified, but seemed to be an older teenager. And he literally said, look, this happens at every American high school. And like, sure, that's a hyperbole. But the fact that this young man was like, yeah, so there was a shooting because that's just a part of his daily reality is preparing for such a thing, thinking about such a thing that when such a thing actually happens, it's like, yeah, it's shocking. Obviously we're all shocked on Saturday. Nobody thought that was how we were going to spend our Saturday evening, but were any of us really surprised? And that's, you're right. Is the, is the absolutely chilling part about all of this, but there's been a dehumanization. I think the, 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 the piece that you're talking about is like, yes, we, we need to oppose their agenda. People's lives and livelihoods are on the line. Right. Women will die if we implement a national abortion ban. You know, babies are separated from their families when we have draconian immigration measures. Like we are talking about the existential threat to people and we need to oppose this agenda. There is a dehumanizing language that I hear some extremist politicians use a lot that, that makes it harder to talk about an agenda and more to talk about a people. And, and particularly when your agenda is engaged in taking away somebody's rights, whether that's immigrants or women or black people, right. 
talking about them in such a way that takes away their humanity makes it easier to implement your agenda, but much, much harder to maintain a functioning democracy at that point. And I think that's what we're all stuck in the middle of right now. And I think you combine that with the fact that it is really easy to get semiotic rifles in this country. Uh, in a lot of cases without a background check, without even a red flag law, meaning that if someone knew this person was unstable and likely to commit something, can't take their gun away. There's no red flag law. And even red flag laws make it really difficult to even actually take a gun away from somebody. So you mix all of what you both have just described so well with the fact that we make it exceptionally easy to give this problem high powered rifles, right? And a, and it's predictable. Like sometimes I talk about with my kids, like when they have an accident and like, because they put their huge cup of water on the edge of the table. And I'm like, okay, is it really an accident when we could have predicted that that was going to happen, that you're going to knock it on the floor, right? You have this environment of heated political rhetoric mixed with easy, easy access to guns. It's predictable. And we're now too used to it. And of course, we see no one on the right talking about that the gun might have been the issue, right? It's, you know, whatever they want to blame it on. But then fine, even if you're right, it's the political rhetoric on the left, but then you gave the problem a gun, right? So I, we still come back to the Democrats of like, let's come up with a policy solution. So maybe we can prevent this kind of thing and have 100% background checks and make it really hard. Nobody needs an uh, automatic rifle. And they just won't even come to the table and talk like adults about real policies to address any of this. And it just seems to devolve into politics and not how we actually fix things and make things better for our communities and our country. And I, and I also just want to point out the collective sigh of relief from people of color, Black people, immigrants, pretty much any person who normally gets stereotyped as violent when the person ended up being a white male, a cis white male. But get ready for the misinformation. I think the point, like, also, I have seen so much misinformation and intentional, even like even people making jokes that then he's like, this is a joke, but then people will use it and pretend it's not a joke. That's true. I mean, a point I would like to also talk about here is from what I have seen in the response from Joe Biden and the Democrats of this is terrible, right? We do not want to condone right. political violence. And let's be very, very clear. This is terrible. Uh, I hope he's okay, which seems to be in stark contrast to way, the way the Republicans and many of them acted when January 6th happened, when Nancy's Pel Nancy Pelosi's husband was attacked, when name any of the events. They only seem to care about political violence when it attacks their guy, which this is not the way to have an adult conversation either, right? Political violence is either bad or it's not, right? Make a stand. Like this irritates me. They can't make a, even a stand on something as simple as hey, political violence, good or bad. And like, hey, kind of good. Uh-oh, now it's our guy, kind of bad. Or violence, Ooh. gun violence. Like I've been seeing this and it feels very insensitive because let's be clear, someone did die. Um, um, innocent bystander did die. A family no longer has their father. But to your point, Amanda, let's care about gun violence when any gun violence is happening. Why do we now only care about the gun violence and we want to, you know, talk about the violence and stuff when our guy is shot at, but when people in Tennessee are crying because their kids have been gunned down at school? So Sandy Hook, Pulse Nightclub. I mean, I just go down the list of all mm -hmm. the things and then it's just kind of like- They're to get over it. Yeah, whatever, get over it. Like I personally would love for- the Republican or GOP or MAGA outrage about this gun violence to transfer to any gun violence that we experience in our country. And unfortunately, I do not see that happening. Um, instead, I see them kind of doubling down on some of their worst rhetoric, like the idea that diversity, oh. equity, and inclusion are the reason why this happened. And that it is the fact that women are even allowed to be in the Secret Service is the reason why this happened. And I actually read something from a um, 
uh, elected officials making statements, I'm like, you know, you do have the right to not say any damn thing at all. Like <laughs> that is an option for you, but instead they just can't help themselves. And I, I don't think some of them know. That. Yeah. I'm like, do you, it's <laughs> like, no one is making you say these things. But, um, one of the things I've read it was something to the effect of like, there is no woman that's more qualified than a man. And I'm like, did that, like, why would you even say that? I had the same sigh of relief that we weren't going to have to deal with the utter demonization and what I was very concerned would just straight up be open season on immigrants or black people or whoever it turned out this shooter was a member of a community if he turned out not to be white. So, so the sigh of relief was real. I, I think that is why you are seeing the attacks on why they're starting to say diversity and equity and inclusion is the reason why this happened, because they can't blame a black person. They they cannot blame a person of color. They cannot blame a, a, a liberal. The, the only person they can blame for shooting at Donald Trump is the young man who shot at Donald Trump. Yeah, exactly. And, and they know that. And so they have to like go wild with where they're going to put their blame because they don't want to put it there. So they say that it's our focus on, I don't even understand the through line from our focus on diversity led to this. Like I can kind of get there maybe on some of the others, but that one just mystifies me. That's why they have to say that it's like the feminist agenda that's co-opting our families. That's why, which they say after everything. That's why, you know, and and that's why they have to blame Joe Biden. I mean, so many Republican elected officials got on the air in the wake of this and straight up said Joe Biden did this. Right. I'm like, no, no, that one doesn't work this time. Oh, that, you know, that Joe Biden gave the speech from the Oval Office that I think we all needed to hear. I, you know, I, I have I'm, I'm not an enormous Biden fan, but I think he has been a very good president. And I, I think he showed that again in this particular moment when he contextualized the violence he contextualized the violence and 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 he told us that we were still facing a major national conversation about what the soul of this country actually really means and and that gets solved at the ballot box and the vast majority of us understand that but the republicans are the, like the extremists they're going to try to use this moment to chill our ability to talk about where our country is going. And we can't allow that to happen. As as Katie Paris said, I thought it was perfect. The opposite of political violence is not silence. Oh, absolutely not. It's it's not. Like we gotta keep talking about the threats to our democracy um, because we care about it. We have to keep talking about the threats to marginalized people and the attacks on women and how unsafe Jewish Americans and Arab Americans and black Americans feel in any given moment. We have to keep having those conversations or we're never going to fix them. And anybody who suggests mm -hmm. that political violence is a reason to stop having those conversations has an ulterior motive because one of the goals of political violence is to stop those conversations. That's what terrorism is supposed to do, right? Right. Like political violence is a form of terrorism. And the point of terrorism is to instill fear and to stop you from doing the things that you would normally do, like stand up to political violence. And so um, I want to point out that when Biden made his speech, he did say we need to lower the temperature. Mm -hmm. But lowering the temperature is not the same thing as stop everything you're doing. I think that it really brings home the point that we have got to fight for the issues. That is where our focus needs to be on the actual issues. And um, when we start, Jess, you made this point earlier, when we start attacking the people instead of attacking the policies, this is the next step. The violence is next. Mm -hmm. And I can say as a person in politics, there was a there was a bit of fear after this happened. Um, there were things like uh, everyone make sure that you're in a safe place. You know, make sure um, that you're safe because now we are all kind of in a vulnerable state because we don't know people's mindsets after this. And um, I think that's real. I mean, I, I was supposed to, and I'm not saying I'm not going to, but I was supposed to do a canvas this upcoming weekend, I'm going to be knocking on doors and knocking on doors is already, uh, it's not meant to be dangerous, but there's always just a level of uh, uncertainty 
when you're knocking on a door of someone that you you don't know. Um, and this early in campaigns, usually the people whose doors we're knocking on are people we don't know and we're not 100% sure where they align politically, but they kind of, according to our data, which data is not um, always perfect, they are probably somewhere on the line, on the fence. And so I you know, do have to think about strategically, is now a good time to engage people who might fall on either side of that fence? And is it safe for me to ask volunteers to put themselves in that situation? So there is a form of terrorism that happens when something like this happens that genuinely does affect democracy because now I'm having to pivot and make more difficult decisions about how I can even run my campaign in a safe way. Lowering the, I I do think we need to lower the temperature and like metaphorically lower the temperature, but also literally, because it is hot outside here (laughs) and we're just like so hot. (laughs) But um, I also think that um, I can't discount just how scary this has been for people who are out here on the front lines, possibly having to engage with people that, we just don't really know how they're going to react right now. Yep, that's a great point. I mean, I think right now, a lot of waiting and listening for what details are going to coming be coming out. It's going to be a lot of misinformation and outlandish accusations are probably not helpful in this situation, but they will probably still be out there. All right, now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Scott Anderson. This Monday, July 15th, we held a virtual event about Project 2025 with historian Heather Cox Richardson. Hundreds of thousands of troublemakers attended our Zoom or watched on Heather's live stream, and we were so grateful to have you all with us. But if you weren't able to catch it, don't worry. The audio of the event will be available right here on the Suburban Women Problem podcast feed. It'll be posted on Friday, and we encourage everyone to listen and share Heather's inspirational words. Thanks for listening, and let's get back to the episode. This week, we're joined by an elections expert and the president of the Strategic Victory Fund, Scott Anderson. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Trump and his team like to talk a lot about fair elections and election fraud. Both of those are in quotes. I know a lot of people can't see the quotes right now. Is election fraud an actual problem? How safe are our elections in America? So our elections are incredibly safe. Um, Election fraud um, really is well below 1%. I mean, it's minuscule compared to um, anything else that people would think of as like a real problem. And and the reason for that is we very much have uh, systems in place that make sure that the people who are showing up to vote are the ones who are actually registered to vote and that there are safeguards all throughout the system to make sure votes get counted. Now that doesn't mean that snafus won't happen, but those snafus are really are usually corrected pretty quickly, um, and uh, and done so in a, in a transparent way so that the public knows that they are happening. What is what is happening in our election system is people who see those snafus or see those challenges or see anomalies trying to make a mountain out of a molehill in order to stoke fear about the system and distrust in the system. We've, we've heard a lot. You, so you talked about only only the people who are registered or eligible voters. We have heard a lot about concerns from the other side that people who are not citizens are voting en masse. Are non-citizens able to vote? How are we solving for that? Are we solving for that? So first of all, I find it laughable, the idea that if you're an undocumented person in this country, and that you're living in the shadows, that you're suddenly going to line up on a Tuesday in November outside of a county or state office and cast a ballot illegally. I mean, just like on a just a basic fact level, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No, I mean, this is a group of people that historically won't engage with like the government benefits that they actually deserve because they are that afraid of dealing with the government. So yes, the idea that they might vote, but like, Let's say that logic didn't prevail. (laughs) Are we trying to stop them from doing it? There are rules in place uh, 
across the country to make sure non-citizens do not cast ballots. In fact, the Constitution is very specific about who can participate in elections. There are a handful of states that allow non-citizens to vote in state and local elections. And I think that, last I checked, was confined to California, Vermont, and Maryland. Um, and those citizens in, in those states set those rules up. They allow that to happen, but it does not happen in federal elections, and it does, certainly doesn't happen in presidential elections. So you're talking about maybe three states that allow it and, and not nearly um, in a way that would impact the federal elections. So then immigrants are allowed to vote, but only after they become citizens. Is that right? Only after they've become citizens, they're allowed to vote. Um, and, you know, our history is full of Im first time immigrants voting. You know, I mean, I actually have the documentation of my great grandfather when he became a United States citizen and he immediately began to participate in elections shortly after that, after he had immigrated from Ireland as a young boy. I mean, it is the cornerstone of participating in our small d democracy is is voting and people tend to take it quite seriously. Where, where do you what what do you what do you think is the motivation behind making people think that our election system is not as safe and secure and you know we know who's voting and we know that they're the citizens but like what what is what why would people try to undermine people's faith in our election system i don't think it's just election systems i think that there is a there's a strategy that's afoot in this country to undermine the systems of democracy you know to undermine people's trust in institutions people's trust in believing the things that are true. Um, and, and this is a big piece of that, uh, is trying to undermine, undermine people's confidence in the outcome of elections. I'll also note that like, if you look at um, where there have been cases of voter fraud, it's pretty easy to figure out when it happens, right? You see these anomalies in the accounting and the different pieces that happen after the election, and then it's easy to prosecute. And so those cases, get notoriety um, and get into the public domain because it's pretty easy to go and prove when those things have happened. In fact, the most recent case was a case here in my home state of North Carolina uh, where Republicans were trying to Im influence a Republican primary, uh, and it led to all kinds of charges being uh, against people who were trying to stuff ballot boxes and doing other things. And again, there's a paper trail. It's pretty easy to prove. Every time we hear about a Republican committing voter fraud, which I, I, I feel it, it is more often than we hear about a Democrat committing voter fraud, I worry that because their leadership is constantly lying to them about people committing voter fraud, they think it's normal and then they go out and do it themselves. Do you have any yeah. sense of that? I, well, I, anecdotally, I mean, I can say like from my own extended family and talking to people in my family in past elections, you know, my my parents, my group of the family, very progressive, very Democrat. But you get beyond that, as most Southern families are, it gets pretty Republican pretty quick. And, um, you know, it's it sometimes is laughable when those examples are given because it's like when they see lines of African-Americans standing outside to vote, they assume that something fraudulent is going on. So there is a racial underpinning to a lot of that and, and then use that suspicion not always, but oftentimes have used that suspicion to do things that on their own are unethical. Like, you know, believing that something is happening when it's not happening um, and then to justify bad behaviors, you know, is a tale as old as time. I mean, right. I mean, it's just like it's just part of kind of I think what's happening um, in the distrust of what's happening in the country. So you also talked about it's a part of a broader strategy to undermine the systems of democracy, all of the systems of democracy. And what I've heard on the other side is, well, we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Right. Is that true? And what's the difference? I mean, it's kind of a distinction without a difference. I mean, it, the basic textbook definition of a democracy is that citizens directly vote on issues, citizens directly vote on leadership and things like that. And a republic is basically there's an intermediary, right? And so we are a republic because we have a United States Congress, right? They vote on issues for us. Right. We are a mm -hmm. republic because we have an electoral college, right? And so we're not directly voting on the issues that are before Congress, nor should we. I mean, that's not really a successful or workable 
system. I mean, I don't know. It's gone pretty well for reproductive rights so far when we let people vote <laughs> on that. True. Like, there's something there's there. Something that too. But in every issue, it would be like a reality show every day, right? I mean, it's just... Oh. Like, um, but no, I mean, I think that that's, that's, the, that's the difference. I mean, it's more that we have elected leaders, we have elected systems, we have courts that dip, are either elected or appointed, you know, there are different people who are making policy decisions that are a step beyond me as an individual citizen. But what we have seen in, in from a political standpoint is, you know, a tyranny of the minority. And what I mean by that is through gerrymandering, through the way that members of Congress are elected, through the way that the federal and Supreme Court justices have been part of a 50 year strategy to move them to the right they are out of touch with where normal Americans are. And so you see that on full display on the Dobbs decision in how it has galvanized ballot initiatives across the country on reproductive health for women. And I, I don't see that going away. I mean, I know in Arizona, there's a huge ballot initiative this year. In Nevada, there's a ballot initiative. I mean, these, these will continue to be successful because of the imbalance between those who are in elected office and where the citizenry really is. Another you you mentioned the electoral college and that is another place where I see an imbalance. I have now lived through two presidential elections where the popular vote was won by the Democrat and the Republican became president anyway. Yep. Do you feel the do you feel similarly like are, are can we look at that and say actually we are a more big D progressive democratic country? than our elected presidents would suggest? Like, do we have one of those republic slash anti-democratic levers in place with the Electoral College that helps facilitate the tyranny of the minority? Well, I mean, first of all, thank you, Alexander Hamilton, for the Electoral College. Um, <laughs> not a fan, gotta say. Not a fan. You know, you gotta <laughs> also remember... Um, so many songs in my head at this moment. <laughs> and, and you know what? Let's let's back up and start. Like, let me let me just what is the Electoral College and how does it work? Then we can get into whether or not we want to keep it. Let's start there. I get this question from my kids all the time and I have tried to explain it and I can never explain it to in a way where they agree that this is how we should do things. But <laughs> maybe I'm not explaining it right. I don't know. So I'm going to start by saying I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I will say that the Electoral College it was set up really as a safeguard. And so each state, you know, depending on your allocation based on the size of the state, your congressional districts, those types of things, has a certain number of electors. And so when you're casting your ballot for president, you know, in North Carolina, where I live, I will be casting my ballot for Joe Biden. I'm actually voting for the 16 electors who are going to be going to the Electoral College to cast, you know, what is pretty much a binding vote at that point, right? And so it is a system that was really meant to create safeguards. I believe one of those reasons was because, you know, in, in 1800, you know, having getting ballots distributed counted like they didn't have the kind of safeguards and electronic ways of doing things that we have today and so this was part of part of that kind of securing of the election and then you know maybe it was also so that if there was a, a reason for cooler heads to to you know to step in i don't know that to be true but there were like reasons why you know in the 1790s this made a lot of sense it doesn't make a lot of sense today mainly because while we feel like counting ballots on election night in the days after is excruciatingly long, it's really nothing compared to what what happened, you know, in in previous parts of our history or even what happens in other countries today. And so things get resolved pretty quickly. There are processes in place to make sure that, you know, if there are challenges, I mean, Donald Trump and his um, allies filed 61 court cases against um, the electors being counted in different states and all kinds of different election security, you have a window of time for those things to get resolved. And all of them were resolved. All of them, were, by the way, were resolved not in his favor, right? But there was due process in place and people got to present evidence and, and that's how the system works. And so really, in my opinion, the Electoral College is you know, a piece of history that kind of belongs in history books and not necessarily in how we're voting for president today. 
my kids would agree with you <laughs> if they had a vote. So can we change it? Is it possible to change it? Well, I mean, I also say that the, the the same signers of the Constitution that put that in place also counted African-Americans as three-fifth people. I mean, so we have all kinds of math problems that don't stand up to history, right? And um, and yes, it can be changed, but it requires changing the Constitution. And that becomes, you know, while it's easier in states to change state constitutions, it's a very high bar to change the Constitution of the United States. And that's why it doesn't happen very often. The vast majority of Americans, I think, understand that our elections are safe. They they trust the process. They've they've lived through it a, a bunch of times. They see it work. They see it not work in other countries as well as it works here. And yet, we're hearing a lot of 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 misinformation, disinformation, just bad information that that makes people think that we're a little more divided on that topic than we actually are do you do you get that sense as well or do you feel like we're incredibly polarized on on how well our elections work you know it's interesting if you spend time in communities with people generally folks know someone who works on election day yeah, right? these are your neighbors so, right right and so like my father-in-law who lives in Tallahassee Florida always works on election day. You know, he's far more conservative than I, I am. I'm sure our ballots don't match up on anything, right? But he loves doing that work, right? And so those people live in communities. And if you ask them about the systems, you know, ask them questions about how elections are run, I think that they're pretty strong advocates for how the how it all works, that there's like so many different safeguards or so many different checks and balances or so many different things. What has happened in this country, and this is something that we at the Strategic Victory Fund have spent a lot of time on, is um, how, you know, the right wing media machine has created a host of channels that keep people glue to their platforms by stoking fear, stoking anger, stoking resentment, and they're making a lot of money in the process. So they're not starting off from a place of how am I making my community stronger? They're starting off from a place of how do I keep people, people's attention on my platforms? And that has been incredibly corrosive throughout our politics. That must have make, makes things tough for folks like your father-in-law, like conservatives who work within the process. Imagine going back and like talking to your friends who are consuming these media shows all day and they think that you're engaging in some fraudulent activity, even though you're a rock ribbed Republican who would love nothing more than to see Donald Trump reelected and you're just doing your Democratic job. Like that's got to be tough for him. Yeah. Well, I, in fairness, uh, I really enjoy being married. So one of the things that we have agreements on is that I don't talk about politics at my father-in-law's house. So that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I totally, that's fair. I understand that. We we have that agreement at parties where like, especially my husband, I'm like, you're allowed to engage if they bring it up, but you're not allowed to bring it up. And it seems to work pretty well. It's a good, it, it's a good rule for us. <laughs> so how do we, I mentioned this poll worker thing. I think another thing is there's like a cognitive dissonance where we're either one, you just don't talk to, you don't talk to people like your father-in-law. It must be that, but we're not going to talk. We're just going to listen to Fox news or whatever platform you're on, or it's my poll is fine. It's all the other polls that are not fine. And there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Right. So what can we do about it? Right. So I feel like right now I can't change the electoral college and I can't change a whole lot of things, but I could become a poll worker. So what does a poll worker do? What does your father-in-law do? And how do you get to be one? Should more of us be kind of volunteering to be a poll worker? I think one of the most important things that people should do is volunteer to work um, for their their local election boards on election day in the run-up to elections. That You get paid, you get a stipend to do it. You get to be, especially for retirees, it's a great experience. And as we've monitored this, there's been a lot of stress on that system and a lot of distrust that people, quite frankly, as I mentioned earlier, are profiting off of. And um, and so they are starved for people to come in, in and to do that work. And I think that if, if you're someone who worries about elections and the sanctity of our elections, spend time doing that. They, they, they would love to have you. 
It's a great way to give back to your community. You'll meet people who are similarly positioned in your community, and you'll learn a lot about how elections work. And I think that that kind of transparency will only make the system stronger. Awesome. So without naming names, can you be a convicted felon and run for the presidency? How does that work? <laughs> can you, in some states, you can't vote if you're a felon, but you can run for president. Is that right? So in, in, I, yes, I think that is true. Um, in some states, you can be a convicted felon and not run. I, I think that all of it just boggles the minds um, as far as how we got to this position. Um, you know, things that 15 years ago would just be devastating for a campaign, like being convicted of 34 felonies, doesn't really register with people. Seems bad. And I think that, you know, part of the problem is we really have become a country that lives in two different bubbles when it comes to how people are perceiving events that occur. And, um, and, and I just think it's incredibly dangerous right now. 15 years ago, I don't think someone, you know, who on the cusp of the election were being exposed for saying incredibly gross things about women would actually remain at the top of the ticket. Right. And, but that happened. Um, and so we're breaking these norms around decency that really diminish us as a country because we're better than this. You know, we are we are a better country. We are a better people. We are better on so many different levels. Than, than what we're being presented with right now. Literally right now, we are better than this. And by we, I mean all of the vast majority of Americans that believe that our, uh, our system of self-governance is working and worth saving, who believe that political violence has no place in our democracy. That is the vast majority of us. And it sounds, it sounds like we're really divided, but if we're living in two bubbles, one bubble is really, really big and it covers all of us and a lot of good facts and accurate information. And the other one is, is, is small, but it's, it's, um, you know, it's vocal and it's, it's something we all have to contend with, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that the vast majority of us agree and, and agree that we're better than this. Right. And, and we've spent a lot of time looking at project 2025, which is like the heritage foundation blueprint for and that the Trump administration officials from his presidency have been a big part of it it has the potential of radically changing the country and it is so out of step with where the American people are but you know the way I've started talking to our funders about this election is this is a really important battle but we're in a much longer war over what kind of democracy we're going to be and so we need people to kind of be well read on this stuff. Mm -hmm. I love that you phrase this as kind of a battle and war. Uh, so it's in the military, but I still love this phrasing that like, I think sometimes we look at everything as like, we just have to win this and then it's over, but it's, sorry, it's, it's never, this is a battle, right? We have to look at the larger war here and keep fighting, uh, you know, live to fight another day. Uh, all right, Scott, I want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank y'all. Welcome back, everyone. Wow, this has been such a um, crazy time period for political news. I think we really need a toast to joy right now. All right, Jess, what do you got for us? What's your toast to joy? Okay, I racked my brain on this one because, you know, it's a little hard to access joy in this particular moment. And I didn't want to be like my dog, you know, who brings me joy every day, but is not relevant to our political system as of yet, at least. <laughs> So what I came up with was petty, all right? But I think petty is a little bit important. Like petty does bring me joy sometimes and and I'm gonna take what I can get. Um, therefore, my toast to joy is the fact that Rudy Giuliani was told he could not, in fact, file for bankruptcy because he had hid too many assets from the court. And what that means is that he has to pay Ruby Freeman and her daughter, Shay, those two election workers who were just doing their jobs, making our democracy work when they decided they were going to try to ruin their lives with baseless lies. 
Rudy Giuliani has to pay those women their money now. That is $150 million that the courts have ruled those women deserve for his lies, which completely disrupted their lives. Absolutely. He tried his damnedest not to pay them. He tried his hard. He tried to say out loud in public, hey, I am completely broke. I am so <laughs> broke. I have no ability to do it. Like that's how desperate he was. He would rather us all think that he was penniless than pay these women the money that he owes them. And the court said, no, you can't do that. And so the idea of Rudy Giuliani just writing the biggest check and Ruby and Shay doing whatever it is they want to do with it for the rest of their lives. I hope they never buy their own drinks ever again. Um, <laughs> that is my toast to joy today. <laughs> oh, I love it. I like that. That that toast is super on brand. I'm, I'm with it. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Jasmine, what's what's yours? Do you have one? I do. I do have a toast to joy. So um, I spent my weekend in uh, Portland, Oregon. It was my first time going there. Um, absolutely beautiful. Where I stayed, we were right on the river. So I, I woke up because I was still like um, circadian rhythm wise. I was still on East Coast time. So I like woke up at 6 a.m. every day and just like went for this long walk on the river. And then we started our day and I was I spent it with a group of amazing um, women legislators from um, all over the country and this, this cohort that I'm a part of. And so it's interesting because when the news broke of all the chaos that happened this weekend, I was with them. And you know what we did? We put our phones down and we continued to do the work that we were doing of, you know, having very intentional, very, um, thoughtful dialogue about, you know, women in politics and our power and things like that. And it was just, I am so glad I was around them versus like, I mean, you know, I could have been anywhere and around anyone, but in that moment, I think I was with the exact people I needed to be around mm -hmm. to absorb that information. And, um, so my toast is to number one to Portland, Oregon. It was beautiful. Um, but also to, you know, the the ladies that I got to spend the weekend with and the moments we had, which were equally, if not more beautiful than the city itself. Oh, and I got to do karaoke. So. Oh, love that. That was super fun as well. <laughs> I love Portland. And also that sounds like the perfect environment to hear the weekend's news. Uh, yeah. I'm a little jealous. <laughs> um, so I was struggling a little with this toaster joy. So I just had a whole, my refrigerator's broken right now. My daughter got me sick. So I spent the weekend having like chills and aches. Oh no. But uh, my toaster joy is my saving grace was DoorDash because I could lay in bed and not worry about that there was a vac, there was nothing in the refrigerator because we had to clear it all out. And I will just DoorDash fresh fruit with <laughs> some breakfast. <laughs> and without getting out of bed. So I am very thankful to be in the year and decade we are in where I can better deal with the fact with life's what conveniences. I know. Yes. I definitely can uh, appreciate the, the little conveniences that we have that just make life a little bit easier than they were a decade ago or like oh. two decades ago. Like it's just... I appreciate, so I'm there with you because I completely understand like that when I'm in my pajamas and I'm like super tired and then my daughter's like, mom, the dog doesn't have any food uh -huh. and the ability to say there will be food on the doorstep in the oh, morning yeah. because I'm going to order it now to be delivered in the morning. I love that. So I'm with you a hundred percent close to that. I think it helps our political powers women that we can take yes. care of the other stuff in other ways when we need to. All right. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you again on another episode of the Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson. Our project manager is Lindsay Quist. And our editorial assistant is Abigail Martin. For more information about upcoming events and trainings, or to learn more about Red, Wine, and Blue, Follow us on social media or at www.redwine.blue.